Thank you. It's my great pleasure to be here to share with you um, several studies that we have recently completed through this consortium. Um, as uh, Sally indicated, uh, the focus of my work is relatively broad, uh, not only energy, but also environmental and safety aspects of transportation. The outline of what I'll try to cover is on this slide. Uh, there are three main sections of my presentation. The first one will deal with uh, the ownership of vehicles, uh, distance driven and fuel consumed. Then I will move to a section on changes in the driver composition in the US. Then some recent data on changes in who buys vehicles in the US. And then I make a little bit of a detour into a fuel economy area. Um, I will be presenting some data that I find very fascinating, especially one slide that shows fuel economy going back to 1923. You have some data annual data on what we have actually achieved on the road for the last 85 or 90 years. So let me start off uh, with the first, present, first section on vehicles and specifically on the number of vehicles. Um, all three subheadings will deal both with the absolute number, which I find less interesting, but also with rates, rates per household, per person, uh, and so on. And those are, I think, the critical parameters, not the absolute numbers, which are confounded, obviously, with the size of the population. Nevertheless, here is the first of my slides of actual data. This is number of light-duty vehicles in the US going back to 1984 to 2012. So this is a number of cars, SUVs, <clears throat> sorry, pickups, and so on. Get my water here. Uh, nothing too exciting or too interesting here because, yes, the, the peak is around, I believe, 2007, 2008, and there's a decrease. Um, the peak is clearly temporary peak as we get more and more people here, that peak will be eventually overcome. What I find much more interesting is looking at the previous data divided by either uh, number of households, number of licensed drivers, or number of uh, people in the states. And here, uh, the peaks are, I believe this one is 2001, um, 2001, 2006, and so on, several years prior to the onset of the recession. And that is one of the takeaway points of my presentation that the maxima that I'll be showing you do not coincide with 2008, let's say, or thereabouts. They occurred several years earlier. So although economic reasons clearly are contributing the down, to the downturn, they were not the trigger mechanism and they were not the main mechanism. Um, I will be showing you a series of two additional parameters that show basically the same pattern, where the peaks preceded the onset of the recession by several years, which I take as a strong evidence that when the economy recovers, we might not ever reach the peak that we have achieved in 2000, let's say mid-2000. Uh, this slide shows the number of households in the US without a light duty vehicle. Um, it averages currently around 9, 9.2. So about close to 10% of uh, households in the US do not own a light duty vehicle. And that number has been basically creeping up last few years. Uh, I guess we hit the low in 2008. Um, even more interesting is, I think, this table. Um, what I have here 
I guess the top got cut off, but uh, what I'm planning here is data for the 30 largest metro uh, portal areas in the US. And I'm showing data for 2007 and 2014. The entries here are percentages of households with no light duty vehicles. So in New York, more than 50% of households do not own a car or SUV or a pickup truck. And San Francisco, that is uh, roughly 31% currently. Uh, the entries in red are those cities where the percentage increased uh, from 2007 to 2012. Uh, out of the 30 largest uh, cities in the US, I believe the count is 21, uh, have actually showed an increase in the proportion of households with no vehicle. Um, I think there are two basic mechanisms here. Um, you have here cities with a reasonable public transportation, such as New York, DC, San Francisco. Uh, you have uh, here also cities with economic problems, such as Cleveland, uh, Detroit, and, and so on, where the increase is unlikely to do to uh, things that I will put my money on for most of the other cities, namely increased telecommuting, increased use of public transportation, uh, and changing age composition of drivers, which I'll get into. But the, the main point of this slide is that there are many cities where you have quarter or more of household with no access to a personal vehicle, which I find fascinating and important. Uh, by the way, feel free to interrupt as I go along if you have any question or comments or, or a clarifying issue. The, the second set of uh, slides is analogous to the first. I'm going to be showing you uh, the overall distance driven in the US for, uh, since 1984, and then the corresponding rates. Um, so this is the overall VMT, but not for all vehicles. This is um, our parceling out light duty vehicles out of the total fleet. Um, and I believe the peak was around 2006. I have a kind of a strange angle on this. I guess I can see it here. Um, and there has been a decrease and now a slight increase. Again, I don't put much weight on this graph, but it is the fundamental data for this graph. So here I have four uh, charts of rates of distance driven per household, per license driver, per uh, vehicle and per person. And all four of these rates peaked in 2004. Again, several years, four years or so prior to the onset of the recession. Um, I kind of let you think about this for 20 seconds. Um, going back to my early argument, given that these peaks or maxima preceded the onset of recession, one cannot ascribe the, the decrease that we are observing uh, to economic factors only. Um, again, they are part of the reason, but they are not the trigger mechanism. And there are other things going into uh, the reasons why we do see a decrease in these rates, and therefore, um, the chances of these peaks being permanent are better. The per registered vehicle was the one I was intrigued by. It really looks pretty constant after the growth. Do you see that being relatively constant in the next half century? Half century is a very, or very long time. So yeah. That yeah. Yeah. Or is, should I not ask this? No, I think it's a very fair question. I just have difficulty sometimes imagining what would be five years from now as opposed to 50. Yeah. Uh, um, because that says that the other factors are the driving factors in, 
each vehicle is driven about 12,000 miles. Yes. Um, you are right that this is the flattest of the curves, uh, which is one of your points. Um, uh, whether we have reached some kind of asymptotic level, I think it's too early to tell. Uh, th there are so many okay. potential game-changing cha uh, events happening right now in transportation that it's wow. difficult. Um, um, fuel consumed is obviously a product of distance-driven and fuel economy, the vehicles that you're driving. And I'll be showing you again a pair of slides. First, uh, the total fuel consumed in the US for light duty vehicles only, uh, going back to 1984. And 2012 is the latest year we have data for. And the peak was indeed uh, around 2004, uh, if I have it right. Um, again, more interesting are the rates. Uh, so we are looking at uh, the top curve is fuel consumed in terms of gallons uh, per year, uh, peaking in 2004, and relatively huge drop um, got, got cut off by something on the order of 12, uh, 1,250 to about um, 1,025 uh, currently of gallons. Um, similar drops for the other three parameters. Um, again, uh, peaks preceding the onset of recession uh, by several years. Well, let me turn to the second uh, main section, and this section will discuss some recent changes in licensure of uh, mostly young people. Um, we have seen some humongous changes as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it used to be the case that people, young people were waiting um, in front of the driver's license office night before they turned 17 or 18 or whatever the cutoff is in that state. That is no longer the case. Uh, here is uh, a graph of uh, percent of people that have a driver's license by age, where the red bars are for 1983 and the blue bars are for 2012. Okay? So if you pay attention to the 16 through roughly 40 year olds, you have a huge decrease in the licensure. Um, for example, the 18-year-olds uh, in 1983, 80% had a driver's license. Now it's down to 58, 59%. But also back in 1983, it wasn't the drinking age 18, and you had to show a driver's license for that? <laughs> um, that would not explain the drop here. Uh, also, the graduate licensing changes would not explain why the peak is not conf uh, why the drop is not confounded to the teenage years. It seems to be extending way past those those years. Uh, um, the flip side of it is uh, this is our contribution. This part has been known before that older people are more likely to try to retain their mobility. They try to hold on to their driver's licenses. Uh, but there is a clear shift of the center of gravity of, of the average age of, of the drivers in the US. Um, because there's also a, 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 a strong effect of age on how far you drive that has a lot of consequences as well. The peak driving in terms of mileage is, is in the middle, a, middle group. Uh, with a uh, relatively sharp drop off in distance driven past 60, 65 years of age. Um, um, in a follow up to, to this study, we did an online survey of 600 uh, persons without a driver's license. These were people between 19 and 18 and 39 who do not have a license. 
And we were curious about two sets of issues. Why don't you have a license? And number two, uh, is this temporary or is this permanent? Um, and uh, here's a sample uh, question with answers to the question is why don't you have a license? Uh, and you can give us more than one answer. So these things do not add up to 100. 37% listed too busy or not enough time, which we interpreted as saying I have different priorities. It's not that I don't have time for something else, but it is not on my radar or it's not that important for me to bother doing it. Uh, Cost was about 32% uh, indicated that it was expensive to drive and to maintain a vehicle. Um, I want to highlight 8%, uh, 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 this group of 8% uh, respondents who indicated that they are able to do a lot of their transaction electronically um, and there is no need to, or there's less of a need for physical contact because they can do a lot of uh, what used to be needed for uh, a car for, now they can do it a uh, uh, long distance. Um, concern about the environment uh, was there, as well as uh, uh, use of public transportation. Um, uh, one of the most fascinating questions was this one. Uh, again, keep in mind, these are people between 18 and 29 who do not have a license. We were asking, we asked them, when do you plan to get a license? One option was, you know, one to two years, five to 10 years, and so on. One option was never, and 21% indicated the, uh, that they do not plan to get a license out of those who currently do not have a license, which is a huge percentage and this is obviously of concern to the auto industry and I would say when you check a lot of people say I don't plan to do it in the next five years, but I probably will have it by five. The, 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 one of the options this is based on answer uh, which was labeled never. So one of there were options one to two yeah. years, two to five, yeah. or never. You know, on the bottom it says never. So this is those people who checked never. Now, they obviously can change their mind, but can. Do you have any sense of how much of those temporal changes you showed us earlier are a result of these demographic changes? Uh, uh, none, because this is normalized to, to the population. So uh, this is percent of people in that age group. So e even if you have more or less, this is a percentage of them. Is some of that decrease in driving oh, the last mean, five those, years a result of these young people not yes, driving? Yes, yes. I thought you were uh, referring to this. Yes, clearly that is part of it. We have not quantified it yet. Uh, uh, the, as I indicated, uh, the average distance driven peaks in, in the 40s, roughly. Uh, and if you have fewer of them or more of them, they will clearly affect uh, the distances driven. Uh, as well as the rates. Uh, okay. um, the second part of the driver's section deals with changes in the gender composition of, of drivers in the US. Um, for many, many years, there were more male drivers than female drivers in terms of who, has, who had a driver's license. Uh, the graph here plots it back to 1963. And on the vertical axis, I have percent uh, of either ma uh, percent males of the total uh, population of persons with a driver's license. In 1963, it was about 60, 61 percent. Uh, right now, it's less than 50. So, we have currently more female drivers in the US than male drivers. Um, and the crossover happened about 10 years ago. Um, however, um, f males still drive more than females do. Uh, less so, the difference is less pronounced now than it was uh, 40, 50 years ago. 
But nevertheless, they drive about 50% more. So if you take into account both the number of drivers and how far they drive, and you pose the question, how many people are on the road who are males, who are females, uh, the answer is right now about 57% of people on the road are males. Even so, they are minority, they drive more, so they are more likely on the road. So on average, the person you will encounter is more likely on the road, is more likely a male than a female. Uh, this is of relevance to lots of things, including safety. Uh, we have done some work on crash patterns of two-person or two-vehicle crashes uh, where we know the gender of the driver. And there are some interesting systematic differences of crashes that involve two females or two males or male and female. So this is of more than just academic uh, uh, interest. Um, uh, <laughs> the, the, the bottom line of, of that study is that uh, female to female crashes are overrepresented, and male to male crashes are underrepresented based on the exposure and expected percentage. As if males were able to, better to predict what another driver will do if he's a male, and and females being less able to predict what other female will do. So as if females were less predictable, especially in the, in the eyes of the other female drivers. <laughs> you just open a giant. <laughs> uh, do, do I get an invitation next year? <laughs> Leave uh, now before you're stuck here. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be happy to send you the, the actual uh, article. Um, the third main section deals with changes in the, in the composition of who is buying vehicles. Um, as we all know, uh, all, all car manufacturers are trying to focus on the 20 year olds, 30 year olds, and uh, you know, even some big name companies are trying to shed the image of you know, selling to the grandfather. Uh, nevertheless, if you look at the vehicle sold per registered driver, this is not per person, this is per registered, uh, per person with a driver's license, the lowest uh, or a number is for uh, 55 to 64 year old. For every 14, roughly 15 person of this age group who have a driver's license, there was one vehicle purchased uh, in a year versus 221 18 to 24 year olds. So it takes about uh, whatever this ratio is, uh, 8 to 1, uh, more than that. Um, the, clearly the peak is, is uh, not where the focus of marketing is. Even so, this is relatively flat from you know, 35 to, to 70. Um, if you look at changes in, in uh, the peak for the last four years for which we have the data, this is normalized to the location of the, of the minimum. Uh, and as I showed you earlier, currently, um, the peak is at, uh, in the group of 55 to 64 year old. Four years ago, it was in the group 35 to 44. So there is a shift towards older buyers uh, in the course of only four years. Uh, so uh, I guess Oldsmobile got rid of their vehicles a little bit too early. Okay. Is that new vehicles only, or is it? Good point. This is new vehicles only, yeah. Um, and the data I showed earlier on, on ownership, new vehicles only also, I should have emphasized that. Uh, how much of an effect do you think this, or how much do you think this is because of the recession? Because the, the recession has probably hit um, the younger, you know, kids coming out of college more than it has um, people who have been well established for a long time. Uh, I, 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 think, I think that's part of it, but I don't think it explains the, the, the magnitude of the difference. Now, if you're talking about the shift for the last few years, yes. Uh, but 
you know, the original peak was roughly in the, in the middle of your productive years. You know, if anybody had money, it would be these people. Um, so, you know, if, if the earlier sh peak was in a younger group than it was, I, I, I would be more inclined to agree with you. But even the 2007 peak wasn't uh, among students. This was already among people presumably fully employed. Um, um, I'm going to make a, a digression for about 10 minutes, and then I'm going to come back and kind of wrap up um, the, the entire talk. Um, the digression will deal with vehicle fuel economy. Uh, it, it, it plays its role in many other parts of what I discussed, but it's also kind of a standalone item. And so I, I would like to show you some recent data. Um, first, I will be talking about some long-term trends uh, in fuel economy. And then I'll be describing briefly our monthly monitoring that we are doing since 2007. Um, and then compare our current performance with the CAFE regulations. Uh, look at emissions, which are a product of how far we drive and what we drive. And then look at some overall societal benefit estimates that we have generated recently. Um, so let me turn to the uh, long and short term trends. Uh, this is a slide that I, I show to everybody who wants to see it because I'm very proud of it. Uh, because it contains data going back to 1923. And we, we got it from various, source, various federal sources that provide estimates about fuel consumed in one source and distance driven in another source. And we calculated the average fuel economy of vehicles on the road. So this is not the EPA sticker value or CAFE value. This, this is the actual effective fuel economy which was for all vehicles, which is the black line, was 14.0 in 1923. And in 1973, that dropped down to 11 something. So the fuel economy actually decreased from 1923 until the first um, oil crisis in 1973. Then it increased sharply until about 1992, three, and then it, the increases were more moderate. So this is the actual on-road fuel economy. Uh, the green uh, curve is for cars only. Um, light blue is uh, pickups and so on. Uh, it is not the case that the manufacturers were purposely producing vehicles with poor mileage, of, you know, going back, uh, but it is. Uh, the, the reason is that gas was cheap, and so the focus was on power and acceleration, and uh, fuel economy wasn't on anybody's radar. Um, since uh, October of 07, we have been monitoring the EPA-rated fuel economy. So this is a little bit apples and oranges, both because here we are looking at rated econom fuel economy, and we are looking at new vehicles only, while the previous graph is for all vehicles and it's the actual on-road performance. But nevertheless, the relative changes are comparable. So here we have um, data for the last seven model years. Uh, the last data we just crunched out about a week ago. For September, that value is 25.3. Um, MPG of new vehicles sold that month compared to 20.1 uh, at the start of the model year 2008. Uh, the difference is about 26% in the MPG domain. Uh, not humongous, but relatively large if you look at the long term horizon. Um, Flex fuel vehicle calculation as well as light duty trucks in there too? Uh, the uh, simple answer is yes. Yes. Um, the CAFE regulations are based on a different measurement than the window sticker value. 
uh, APA has a different protocol to derive those numbers. Furthermore, they allow manufacturers to meet the requirements not only by the actual performance, but also by giving them credits for a variety of things, such as um, uh, refrigerants in air conditioners, which are relatively uh, good for the environment, uh, flex fuels, alternative fuels. So you get credits for a lot of things that you could use. You could also bank. Uh, your credits if you overperform the requirements. So the EPA recognizes the fact that there will be other ways of achieving the, uh, the nominal uh, 54.5 in model year 2025 by also providing a second number, which they don't talk much about, but it is on the books, which currently is 46.2. This is the actual CAFE performance without credits. Uh, this gap is the gap that manufacturers could use by doing other good things for the environment with their vehicle, basically. So the fuel economy could be 46.2, but if they have a good refrigerant, if they have an alternative fuel source for the vehicle and so on, they'll get credit that will artificially boost that value to 54.5. By knowing the blue, um, so, sorry, blue target lines, we can now compare our measurements, the CAFE average value, with the goal. And that's shown here. Well, it will be shown on the next slide. This is our sister measurement to the window sticker value. These values are the CAFE values unadjusted for all the credits. And if you take the monthly, I'm sorry, the yearly values, which are, sh which are shown here, and compare them with the uh, EPA unadjusted CAFE value before the credits, again, I'm taking this blue line and over uh, uh, posing that on top of our data. So, here we have the CAFE projected achieved, as they call it, versus the actual achieved. You see that for the last three years, we have met and slightly exceeded the goal uh, written in the regulation. So uh, here by one-tenth or two-tenths of MPG and so on. So we are sort of on track to uh, meet uh, these requirements if the current trends continue. Question, are those MPG numbers uh, specified for the new vehicle sales, or are they measured as the way they're actually driven on the road? Uh, the, the blue numbers are numbers that EPA derives from their testing protocol in their lab. Okay, so it's specified or rated, I should say. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, one thing that I forgot to highlight is, is, is a couple of points here of, of some interest. Uh, th this is the window sticker change, a relatively you know, monotonic curve, but with some interesting bumps. Uh, this is the first time we hit $4 a gallon. Uh, these two points are the months for cash for clunkers, unusually good performance. This is the month following the cash flow clunkers program and usually bad performance. And if you average out these three points, you get no net benefit and so on. So there, there is a lot of uh, interesting uh, um, uh, observations, I think, in, in this uh, set of uh, curves. Um, in addition to monitoring uh, fuel economy, we also monitor emissions. We monitor emissions indirectly by combining our estimates of fuel economy of new vehicles and distance driven. And that's shown in this graph. Um, the red uh, line is basically 
an inverted function of the fuel economy I showed earlier, the cafe values, but inverted and normalized to the first month of our monitoring. So from that perspective, currently, we consume about 19% less fuel per distance driven when we buy a new vehicle than people who bought a new vehicle seven years ago. Analogously, if you look at distance driven per person, I'm sorry, per driver, normalized to seasonal variation, normalized for the rebound effect. If you, if you drive more fuel efficient vehicles, you will be driving a bit more. But if you take all that into account, uh, currently uh, the average driver of a new vehicle drives about 5% fewer miles than an average driver uh, did seven years ago. So if you cross multiply the blue line with the red line, you get our green line, which is our estimate of the changes in emissions produced by a buyer of a new vehicle now versus emissions produced by a new vehicle buyer seven years ago, about a 23% drop uh, in the course of seven years. Um, Um, my final um, subsection uh, presents some uh, quantification of the societal benefit of the, the changes I showed you uh, in terms of the fuel economy observed. And uh, well, I'll preface it by saying that over the course of the seven years that we have been monitoring fuel economy, we have collected data on 93 million vehicles which currently represent about 38% of all vehicles, all light duty vehicles on the road. So we have a big chunk of the current um, fleet in our books. And we were curious, what are the cumulative benefits by the improvements that we have observed in the past seven years? And the way we did it is that we uh, calculated uh, two fuel consumption curves. The green curve is the actual consumption of all 93 million vehicles that we have monitored since October of 2007 through September of 2014. So we, the 38% of the total fleet has currently, has cumulatively consumed about whatever it is, 160 billion gallons of fuel. The red line would have been the fuel consumption curve if the fuel economy that was in effect in October of seven was frozen. If there were no changes in the fuel economy since then. If all these vehicles purchased each individual month were the same as in 2007. And the cumulative savings correspond to 15 billion gallons of fuel uh, over the course of these seven years for the 93 million vehicles that we have data on. The 15.1 the billion gallons of fuel correspond to 297 billion pounds of CO2. And another way of looking at it is to convert that to the current consumption for all vehicles on the road, including trucks and buses. And the 15.1 billion corresponds to about a month worth of consumption uh, currently in the US. So in the course of seven years, the improvements that we have uh, achieved saved us about a month of current consumption, small or big, depending on how you look at it. Uh, um, and the final substantive slide um, looks at the current savings. So for the last month for which we have data, which is September of this year, uh, all these vehicles, uh, and we, we took into account the scrappage rate. So all the vehicles that we have monitored, minus the ones that are no longer on the road, have in September saved us about 614 million gallons of fuel or 12 billion pounds of CO2 or 
a drop of 6% uh, of the consumption currently. Um, let me come back now to, to the original question that I posed. Uh, has motorization in the US peaked? Uh, and my answer is that the, the likely answer is yes, uh, about a decade ago. Um, and this is based primarily on the, the argument that the maxima that we observed in the rates preceded the onset of recession by several years. Uh, and that's fundamental to, to my, my way of thinking. And, and therefore, it is unlikely that when the economy recovers to pre-recession levels, we will go back to where we were. We will, we will go up, but we will never, if I had to bet, be back where we were in, in early 2000s. And here is my listing of, of kind of the likely reasons for the, the societal changes. Uh, increased telecommuting, small but noticeable over the last few years. Increased use of public transportation. Shift of the population to large cities with reasonable or acceptable uh, public transportation. Nothing on par with you know, many European cities, but uh, relatively good. Uh, uh, changing age composition of drivers, that relates to several questions posed about whether some of the shifts are due to the age uh, changes. And uh, the virtual contact reducing the need for physical contract, contact uh, argument. And that, I think, concludes my, my oh yeah, I, have, I, I couldn't say, I couldn't um, talk uh, here without mentioning self-driving cars. So I, I will, very briefly. And uh, we did an online survey uh, in US, US, UK, and Australia about what, what drivers think about self-driving vehicles. And here's a set of answers to a question, how concerned would you be about driving or riding in a vehicle with complete autonomous uh, um, uh, setup, which is the level four technology. 36% of, of the US respondents are very concerned. Um, furthermore, when we ask them, what would you do if you were to ride in a completely self-driving vehicle? 23% told us they would not drive in one. Um, out of those who, who said they would, 35% would watch the road. Now, that's the point of the self-drive vehicle, that you don't have to watch the road. So I, 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 I don't know. Anyway. Um, yeah, there are some interesting uh, other, other, other percentages here. Does this represent uh, just a failure in math? <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, we are just completing the same survey in India, China, and Japan. And I don't want to say much about the results, but the pattern is quite different in India and China than here. It's, it's, it's just completely different. Uh, Japan is more like us. Um, this is my email address uh, if, if you have any follow-up comments or, or questions. And I'll be happy, obviously, to answer questions here. Thank you. OK, questions. And let's start with the students. Students, OK, how about you? Yep. So in addition to the trends you've identified. Uh, I'm sorry, could you stand up? Because I can't hear that. Sure. In addition to the, um, the trends you've identified, do you think we should be taking kind of tangible policy steps on top to accelerate that demotorization? Or should we just let natural forces sort it out? That's, that's a good question. Um, we as researchers always have this dilemma of, of trying to be impartial and uh, just lay back and present facts uh, versus thinking, well, we have the answers and we should tell everybody what the answers are. Um, there's, there's, there are lots of other considerations I have not taken into account, such as what are the economic impacts of all these changes? You know, what industries will be suffering? What uh, will be the consequences on unemployment? Um, 
It's a good question, and I don't have a good answer, unfortunately. Okay, um, yeah, we'll go over there. Yeah. Can you say a few words about the impact of online uh, shopping and whether or not that's increased or reduced the amount of miles driven, the trade off between heavier duty trucks versus? Yeah. Um, obviously, our focus was or is on light duty vehicles. So the online shopping, which is among the 8% answers of why you don't have the license, namely that you can do your business online more readily, has clearly reduced travel of light duty vehicles. Uh, now, to what extent the FedEx and UPSs have increased their uh, mileage and whether they have overcompensated for the reduction in light duty vehicles, we don't have the answer yet. Uh, and I don't even know whether we can get that from UPS and, 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 and FedEx. Uh, um. I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak to the role of uh, commodity prices in driving these trends. Um, particularly in the last month, we've seen a big drop in oil prices. And I, I saw one article that was pointing to uh, reduced purchases of hybrids just in the last month because of that. Um, so if you could speak to how, that, yeah. how that's shown um, in your research. Every month when we generate these uh, numbers, uh, a colleague of mine um, make a prediction of what the number will be based primarily on price of gasoline. Um, and if you look at the last month drop, which is a large drop, relatively speaking, it's half a uh, MPG, uh, we were more or less on the money because we knew that the price of gasoline dropped by about a, uh, a quarter in a month. So a lot of the small bumps and grinds are driven by um, price of gasoline. On the other hand, we get very easily accustomed to, to uh, new levels. And what sounded to us ridiculous five or six years ago is acceptable now. So. Um, have you looked at all at car sharing and ride sharing and how it's affected the total vehicle fleet and license or driver team? Um, not, not ourselves. There, there is some work uh, from UC Davis on, on that issue. Uh, so there is beginning to be some quantification of that effect, but we have not yet done any work uh, to try to tease out how much of that is, is due to that. Uh, Can you ask one follow-up? Yes. Um, automated vehicles, did you see any differences in respondents by age? Uh, yes. Um, some of them are kind of predictable that younger people are more likely to be willing to try things and be less concerned. Um, um, maybe that was kind of the main, main difference by, by age. Uh, so you, you showed the changes in prevalence of, of um, having a license by age, but you didn't show the change in the actual underlying age pyramid. Do you know that is the number of actual people in each group, right? And I think this goes to Ken Calera's comment a little bit, the number of actual people in each group. So how much of, of the effect in, and maybe it's in DMT or maybe it's in um, you know cars per, per household, how much of this overall effect that you see is not due to this age aspect, but the actual let's just say the baby boom is sort of passing through the system, right? Um, sort of one of people is, is aging. Um, it's, it, are you able to disentangle how important that is? Or We have not done, uh, done it in any formal way. Uh, maybe that is the next, next thing to look at. Uh, um, I mean, it strikes me there's a lot of people who are reaching an age where they're going to be driving less. So maybe this is durable for decades. Um, I guess the, the, the way I, I look at this is that given that the peak driving is done you know, in these age groups, uh, the fact that there would be few, these are the future buyers of the vehicle. So if, if there would be fewer of them, that if anything might accelerate the decreased uh, distance driven, for example. Um, and maybe ownership as well. Uh, 
now that gets partially compensated by, by this increase here, but older people don't drive as much. Uh, but they are more used to having a car now than older people were 30 or 40 years ago. So maybe the, the pattern of driving that they acquired in middle age might persist more into the old age now than it did before. So maybe we'll see flattening of the distance-driven curve by age, uh, but we don't know yet. Uh, okay. And I think you in the blue shirt, didn't you have a question? Oh, yes, yes. Um, uh, what about your study that you proposed, that you've already showed some results. This is about what people would do as they uh, were driving in an autonomous vehicle. Um, I would suggest a possible addition to that, and that is add uh, uh, the question, if the vehicle, as we know, uh, uh, autonomous vehicles have robotic control systems, which can be much more accurate than regular drivers. So add the question, if the vehicle were traveling at 135 miles per hour through traffic, what would you be doing? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, initially, yes. Um, we, 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 we did have a question. Um, it was a series of questions. What would, you, would you be concerned about the following? One question was, would you be concerned about uh, self-driving vehicles uh, being driven by itself back home. You know, you, you go to work and you send it back home so that your wife can use it. Uh, we also ask question, would you be concerned about uh, whether self-driving vehicles are as good as actual drivers? And a large percentage of uh, respondents were very concerned about the latter question, namely, they are still eager to try it, but they are they, they are not that confident that they will be as good as actual drivers. Now, we as drivers, we always think we are better than everybody else. I mean, <laughs> most people, if you ask them, are you average, above average, Bill? You know, most people say, I'm ab above average, which is obviously impossible. Everybody cannot be above it. But uh, there is obvious. <laughs> <laughs> Just a joke. <laughs> Good point. Um, I, I, I put the last two slides in my presentation because I, I am not confident that the self-driving vehicles will change drastically what I have shown earlier. Um, I, I think many of the changes um, will persist whether or not we have self-driving vehicles. And I don't see self-driving vehicles being on the on the road as soon as many at Google and other places are, are telling us uh, will be the case. Uh, I think there are many, many legal issues. There are many, many moral issues. Uh, uh, I think the moral issues are probably more important than the legal issues. Uh, none of the system will be foolproof. And the system will have to decide whether you're going to hit the tree or whether you're going to hit the pedestrian. And that is not a decision anybody wants to face. Um, and to rely on a vehicle to make the decision is even worse in mind of many people. So I, I hope I, this long-winded answer was, was OK. Could you go back to the one with the cities? Which one? The one with the cities. OK. Uh, on some of your other questions, do you do those by geographies? The reason I wonder is I'd be really this curious. One? Uh, yes, yeah. The uh, reason I wonder is at least there seems to be patterns around here that you may or may not be representative of a lot of places. I mean, yeah, yeah, given all the car sharing, well, right here, bicycles, like crazy, right? uh, seeing Google cars on the road all over the place. I don't know how many people have ridden in one. Yeah, okay. Fair number, okay. Um, were you in the, the highway vehicles or the town vehicles? Highway. Highway vehicles, yeah, okay. But the town vehicles, they say uh, bicycles and pedestrians are cool, small dogs and cats. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> anyway, so I'm curious about your, is your other data uh, stratified by, by, by areas or are there differences? Uh, some of our data, uh, we have information on where the respondents are from. Some of them are, we do not have. Um, I would expect here to not be the same as Los Angeles. Yeah. For yeah. Now, you're talking about this area. What I find fascinating, if you compare San Francisco with San Jose, uh, now there are good, probably many good reasons uh, why 
the numbers are so hugely different. Um, but they are both in California uh, and so on. So this, some of the things are the same, but many things are different, obviously. OK. And did Jim, did you have a question? It, if we go back to that one before about the 83 versus the, the percentage of drivers, I'm just wondering, uh, yeah, what seems strange about 83, maybe you can explain this, is why the numbers decline. That is, uh, almost 98% of the 30-year-olds 30, 30 uh, had a driver's license, but by the time they got 40, there was up down to about 91%. I mean, people did get DUIs and lose their license, but it couldn't be that many that are doing this. So it, it's strange, and I'm wondering if some of the difference is how we collected the data and interpreted from those early years. Um, I, I think... Uh, your point is, is well taken, and I think a part, but I think small part of this is due to change in methodology. But I can't imagine uh, why we would see these things of such a great magnitude um, for a relatively large set of age groups. Uh, about pulse aging through, because if you look in the 1983, the maximum is at 30 to 34, and now it looks like it's 60 to 64, which is 30 years later. So there, there, is, there is some of it there. Uh, um. Okay, I think we have a question over there, and then that's actually going to be the last one. We're going to wrap up with you. Yeah. So on the autonomous vehicles, because one is uh, something they want to consider, which is the belief is if you have a high penetration of the uh, automated vehicles that your fuel economy will go up because you won't have as much idling in heavy traffic. But the question that I wondered whether you asked was whether people had concern if the cars were on the road versus riding in it. There's a difference between what you're concerned when you're in the car and you could have some control versus they're out on the road and it's like you don't know when something will go bad and you'll get hit. Well, we had bo both questions because we first asked them, how comfortable are you riding a vehicle? And then one of the questions I mentioned earlier, how comfortable would you be sending the car back home on a on yard? And they are more concerned about, obviously, the latter one than the former one. Uh, let's say you go to work and you send the car back home so somebody else can use it. People are concerned with killing other people and being killed, <laughs> is what you're saying? No, other <laughs> unoccupied uh, cars okay. killing you. It's still you, but you are going to be hit by uh, a car that goes back home. That's the answer. That's your car.